But when, when you ask a question out there, you need to speak loud enough where everyone can hear you, and I'll repeat it so that everyone can hear it. So we can work this together. I don't want this to be an information dump or a big fire hose on Wednesday nights of you know, everything you need to know about the Bible. We're not going to play that. Well, every week we're going to try to walk away with one principle that we can put in our toolbox for our faith and so that we can share our faith with other people. All right, so starting off tonight, if you're out on the edges and you want to scoot in some where you could see everything, then at this time you could do that. I, I did reserve some of the high dollar seats on the front rows. They're only $49.95 tonight. We've marked them down. So if you want to move up here on the front seats, that would be fine. How about that? A uh, couple of uh, quick announcements. This week I had a revelation from God. It was directly from it. It's the first time I've heard his voice. And he told me why he invented summertime. It's so that we would get a small taste of what hell is like and we wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> is that not the truth? <laughs> Come, if this is even a, a, a thumb prick of what hell is, and I don't want anything to do with it. So uh, the whole thing about eternity with Jesus and air condition, I'm in. I'm in there. All right. Uh, the other one is um, if the Boston Butts and Ribs, the Labor Day fundraiser, the cutoff day for that is this Saturday. So if you're interested in ordering some of those, the sign-up sheet is out there in the foyer. All right, I'm excited tonight. Hey, uh, one more time, if you guys want to move in so you can see everything. Next week, Ray Tucker, our new pastor, is the dog. He's the bomb. We, we got a TV that is bigger than the state of Arkansas coming. <laughs> and, and it's on a brand new rolling stand. It's a Cadillac. And so next week, we're going to try to transition to the bigger, better, updated TV that I won't know how to operate. So, but it'll be here, and it'll look nice. Uh, so next week, we're, we're going to keep upgrading and fine-tuning this, and Justin's going to try to do all the slides from a clicker from me next week, and so that may help us out a little bit. Um, I'm excited about our series. Um, our theme is rooted. rooted. Very good. And our theme verse is Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Look at this, man. We are cruising tonight. I am two for two. This is pretty good stuff. Um, by the end of this series, you're going to know Colossians 2, 6, and 7 from memory. So you just assume memorize it now. But when, when, you, when you're in church or when you're reading the scriptures at home and you're reading through a passage, maybe I'm weird or maybe because I, I learned grammatical breakdown and Bible study methods, they taught us that. But I think through... A passage what is the author's intent and what's the flow of argument in any passage that I go to my mind automatically goes what's his points and sub points and how is he supporting his main idea who what when where why and how I'm asking those questions of every passage that I'm studying so if we did that tonight with Colossians 2 6 and 7 I'm gonna think out loud with you about how I process a passage to understand it. Therefore, as a result of what Paul has just talked about, that's context, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, stop right there. Paul, whenever he chooses words to describe Yeshua, if he chooses three of them, then it must be very important. And every one of those names has significance. The Christ is the promised one of the Old Testament. Yahshua is the one that saves. And Kyrios is the one who is Lord of everything. And the question is this, have you received him? As, as we start into the verse, Paul is assuming that you have received him and that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So that's the first question. Have you received him? And then the second question I would have from this verse is, what does it mean to receive him? Floor is open. What do you think? All right, and what else? What is it? Do what? To receive him as Lord. Which means, uh, Craig, I'm going to do it. I'm going to push you. The what? Surrender to Christ as Lord. Okay, I could push you. 
listen, the enemy has changed all of our definitions. Well, I believe in Jesus. Hey, for me, that means nothing. You tell me you believe in Jesus, my next question is going to be, what does that mean? Because believe in Jesus could be, I believe in the historical figure that was Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago in the land of Palestine. That doesn't get you to heaven. The devil believes that. So when we talk about receiving Jesus, it's got to be more than just intellectual knowledge. Everybody see? So when I'm thinking through a passage, I'm asking every word, why are you there? If you are a believer, then listen to what Paul says. You need to walk in Jesus. So what would that look like? Uh, that you would be firmly rooted and built up in him and established in your faith. All right, so the question tonight is, if you took an assessment on how rooted you are and how built up and established you are in your faith, how would you score? If I asked you the top 10 questions that this generation is asking about Christianity, could you answer them? And if for a moment there's a little bit of fear and trepidation, and you would say, well, gee, I don't know what the questions are, and I don't know if I would know the answers, that's what this series is for. You're in the right place on Wednesday nights. Because this series of Rooted is not only for you that your roots would grow deeper in understanding God and his ways, but that we might be able to present the truth to this generation. And we're going to talk about that more tonight. So we should be rooted and built up in Christ and our faith and trust in him would grow stronger. We would trust, we wouldn't be afraid of this generation's questions. We would be able to walk into their conversations and know of how we can give an account for the hope that we have. Everybody tracking with me? That's this rooted series that we're in. Um, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And the implication is, in that last phrase, is that someone's teaching someone in the church. And, and I believe the buck stops here. I think we have done a pitiful job of equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. I think we have in Western civilization. And that's why our mouths are shut and we're not sharing the good news of the gospel. Because we're afraid to. We're, we're going to mess it up. I don't know what to say. And that's why we're having this series. Amen? We good? All right. I, I have never taken karate, taekwondo, or judo. Never taken those. I have taken alligator wrestling 101 and almost failed. But I haven't taken those. But I, from what I understand, judo is different from the other two arts or disciplines and it's different in the sense that in judo you take your en your enemy or your opponent's energy and you you if they're coming in to charge you then you move and take their energy and use it in your offense and defense am i correct with all? how many of you have taken judo one am i right you use their energy and your defense or offense hey would you like to come up ken and do it just no no that's <laughs> and if you would, would you practice on Bo? <laughs> All right. This generation, they got questions. That's their energy. It, it's legit. The questions are not bad. I'm thankful they're asking the questions. So let's take their energy and use their questions in our offense and defense so that we can tell them about Jesus. That's this series, that we're going to be equipped that when whatever the conversation comes up, up in your Mondays through Saturdays in the real world, that we're able to give an account for the hope that's within. That's this series that we're presently in. Hey, folks, we got the answers. We really do. I don't care what the question is, we have all the answers. I don't know all of them, and I'm not the greatest apologist to articulate, but I know the fundamentals where I'm going to go, and we're going to be doing that during this series. Um, Alistair Begg, do you all know Alistair? He's a Scottish, comes on the radio at 8 a.m., which is a total bummer. I'm just pulling in the parking lot at church when he comes on. Uh, 
on, and then I think he comes on at around noon. This is a quote. I, I highly recommend him, his podcast, YouTube. You go home tonight. Don't waste your time an hour and a half on a movie. Watch an Alistair Begg sermon. The one with the thief on the cross is my all-time favorite. If you've heard it, you know what I'm talking It's beautiful what he does with the thief on the cross. All right, this is what Alistair said. What are the, hey, I think I got that on a, I do, look at that. Who I almost forgot. That's why I need you next week, so I don't forget. What are the situations you face that you na naturally see as obstacles to sharing the gospel? How might they, in fact, be opportunities, our energy, that we can launch from? Who are the lost and longing people that God has placed in your life today? I want you to answer that question in your hearts. Grandkids, your kids, the people at work. It might be one of your siblings. could be your mom and dad. Who are the lost and longing people that God has placed in your life today? They need your God. Um, and they could meet him through your loving boldness. Wouldn't that be something if God used you to lead your grandson, to lead your brother or sister to Christ, a co-worker? Wouldn't that be a miracle? And he wants to do that. That's what he called us to do. It is the will of God that that happens in our lives. That's why we're having this series. Let's pray. Father, my prayer is simple, as they always are. I ask you to give us boldness so that we could spread the words of truth and life. I ask you to equip us, even tonight. Holy Spirit, Jesus said you would teach us all that we need to know. Tonight, speak freely. Amen. Amen. I hear you back there. The enemy opposes God in any and every way. In Matthew 13, 24 and 25, it's a parable about the wheat and the tares. That the good master, he sends his workers out and they sow the wheat, and at night the enemy comes and he, and he sows the tares. Right on our heels, the enemy is working. And the question is, how do we keep sowing when there's so much disinformation around us? You think about the disinformation. It's on Facebook. Woo! It, it's in the media and the evening news. Uh, the disinformation is in our schools. What we need? All right, I'm getting adjusted. You gonna crack my back? Yeah. Easy. I got 62 years on that back. Don't mess it up. How's my hair look back there? It's beautiful. Am I okay? okay? Usually in the summertime it gets frizzy. All right. The disinformation, Facebook, media, our schools, colleges, even our churches, and Western civilization, and I could go Africa also. But the question isn't, how do we keep sowing? The question really is why do we keep sowing? What's the motivation for this rooted series or that you would start to put these tools in your toolbox? The why is found in why did Jesus come? Why did he say he came? Someone tell me. To seek and save the lost. All right, why does he leave us here? I could give you multiple answers, but in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 and Acts 8, why did he leave us? To evangelize. Go make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go make disciples and go and be witnesses. Everybody tracking with me? So the disinformation, he already knows about it. He ran into tons of it when he was here. From the most religious people of his day, they were full of disinformation. And he walked straight into it with the truth, with boldness. And the power of the Holy Spirit gives us that same boldness to be lights in our generation. That is the fact for every one of you in this room here tonight. So tonight, keep on sowing. It works. 
The, the enemy's sowing the tares or the weeds right on our heels, but keep on sowing and it works. And you know how I know it works? Because you're here. How did you come to know Christ? The generation before us kept on sowing. And think about when they were sowing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s for us that are older. Think about what they were sowing in the middle of. And, and they could have panicked and had fear that the, the whole world was going to hell in a hat basket at Woodstock. And they kept sowing, and, and here we are. Amen? So in this generation, it's the same. We plant, we water, and what does he do? He gives the increase. But we're faithful in planting and watering, and he's faithful to work the miracle that is you, and that is the next generation. And, and I want to see that miracle expanded at Rainbow Presbyterian Church. That, that we're equipped and we go out as bright lights and we're ready to give an account for the hope that's within. With a passion and with a zeal. All right, we start off tonight with God. That's where we are. Number one in the series, the first topic that we're going to address and rooted is God. Why start here? In the beginning, God. Hey, let me do that. I, keep, I quit. I lose my notes. Hey, God, there you are. In the beginning, God. You get that wrong, everything else I talk about in the series is wrong. It, it is the elementary founding stone of this whole series on Rooted. And so we need to be able to ask the questions, do I, need to, do I really need to believe in a God? Is there a God? I don't believe that God exists. How can anybody be sure and really know? Those are the questions they're asking. And, and so that's why I'm going to start here, and I'm going to do this. I was hoping you would play. You believe in God? No. Don't believe in God. He wants to. Can we tell him?
That one wins. I hope this thing stops and doesn't keep going. Ah, I'm good. Hey, uh, how would you answer? If that was the conversation and that came up, how would you answer it? Where would you go in those situations? Do, do you automatically have some places in your toolbox, in your filing cabinet, that you could pull out and turn it to Jesus Christ and the gospel? That there really is a God. Our question tonight is, is there really a God? How can we prove it? That, that's where we're at tonight. All right, good. True. Everyone believes in something. Believes. Uh, I want to tell you a story about a young boy. He loved to play with fire. Loved fire. In his parents' pantry were hundreds and hundreds of... Remember the books of matches? that you would peel out and strike on the book that folded open. There were, his dad was a politician, so there were thousands of those boxes of political matches in the pantry. And the little boy would fill his pockets up with those on the weekends and go make fires all over the place. At school, that little boy learned that the sun is one great big ball of fire. And the little boy was mesmerized. He not only learned that, he learned that the sun is a star and the stars are without number and they're all great big balls of fire. As that little boy laid on the St. Augustine grass, late in the evening under the oak trees, as the locusts were chirping and the tree frogs were croaking, he looked up at the stars and he asked this question, who lit them? I play with fire every day. The little boy was me. Someone had to light those stars on fire. As I got older, I realized there's no way, there is no way, it's statistically impossible that every star in the solar system internally combusted, fired up its fire engines, and started on fire. So who had the power to go millions of miles, millions of miles, and millions of miles and start every star on fire. Someone had to do it. Someone had to do it. And so even when I was a little boy, I'm thankful that my parents raised me, brought me to church every Sunday. We went to a little Baptist church in Luling, Louisiana. And I'm very thankful for that. But even early on, the Lord was already working in my heart that I knew the answer to the question, does God really exist? The foundation in the beginning, God. From the beginning, even before I became a believer, I knew God was real. I knew that was a truth just because of fire. Fire! Hey, it's, it's one of the things that taught me that God existed, that little boy many years ago. Is there a God? How can I be sure that God is is there? How do you know God exists? It's seventh grade. I'm in Mr. Meacham's science class at J.B. Martin School. Um, on Fridays, I love Mr. Meacham's class because if we had enough questions, he wouldn't do a lesson. Uh, we could just ask stupid questions, and Mr. Meacham would answer the stupid questions. And this one day, someone asked him what he thought about God, and this was his answer. I'm an atheist. I don't believe there is a God. You cannot prove the existence of God. If you can't see God, how do you know that he really exists? Mr. Meacham, seventh grade, and I'm sitting in his class. And so the great theologian that I was back in the seventh grade did this, and Mr. Meacham did that, and I said, then I am going to assume you don't believe in air. I don't know where I got that from. But it was one of the files, it was one of the tools in my toolbox that I pulled out that God had given to me that that's why we're doing this series. And so I pulled the tool out, then I'm going to assume you don't believe in air. And everyone in the class roared laughing, and he had a very intellectual answer on why he believed in air but didn't believe in God. 
But even then, my system of apologetics was starting to develop on what I believed and why I believed it. And that's our series, Rooted. Another video clip, a good one. No. Oh, good. The Bucket List, great movie. There is so much I could say from that video clip. But that, I'm going to run through some things now just to give you an idea of what this generation, the comments on what they believe. I resist all belief. Well, good, tell me how that works out for you. Now, that was just a movie. But these are some of the real ones. Come on. There we go. Anybody know who this character is? That was me when I was 17, no. <laughs> in 1971, one of his solo albums had great success, and there was a song on it called Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there are no countries it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Remember that line? Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. That's my generation. And people loved that song. And the enemy inspired it and used it to confuse a lot of people about what the truth is. John Lennon has since passed away. And I guarantee you this, if what I believe is the truth, his truth has changed drastically. If what we believe is the truth, then what John Lennon believes today is quite different than what he believed when he wrote that song. Do you know that lady? What movie was she in? 
Pirates of the Caribbean, did I hear that back there? That's right, she was in Pirates of the Caribbean. Kyra Knightley, I think I pronounced her name correctly. Pirates of the Caribbean, this is what she said. Religion is just a way to get away with anything. Religion is a crutch to do bad things and then just ask forgiveness. If only I wasn't an atheist, I could get away with anything. You'd just ask for forgiveness and then you'd be forgiven. It sounds much better than having to live with guilt. Her quote. I, I, I wish I could talk to her as an atheist because I would want to ask her one question. Well, then where does the concept of guilt come from? If you believe that there's guilt, then you believe that there's a moral standard. And where does a moral standard come from? Hitler? He had a moral standard. And if there isn't any God, then maybe he was just thinning the herd and he had a good idea. I could go on. Let's go on. Let's do another one. Anyone recognize that gentleman? Stephen Hawking. No God created the universe. Best-selling book, The God Delusion. The more people embrace science, the less they will embrace God, quote-unquote. Stephen was this generation's spokesman in our classrooms across colleges all over this country. He was the major voice in the colleges of this generation. There is no heaven or afterlife. That is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark, Stephen Hawking. Hey, he passed away. If what we believe is the truth, then I promise you this about one of the greatest spokesmen of this generation. He has changed his perspective on that. Drastically, he has changed it. Hey, do you know science is a good thing? I, he, he's, he would attack me that as a Christian, I don't like science. I love science. I, I do. I love science. Because in science, I get to, as a little kid, explore everything my father created and take a look at how it works. That's what science does. I, I'm a big proponent of science. Scientists that believed in God. Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, Blaise Pascal, Isaac Newton, um, Gregor Mendel, Galileo, even though the quote-unquote church attacked him because he said that the sun went around the, uh, I mean, that the earth went around the sun, and he, they would name, said he was a heretic. But Galileo did believe in God, our God. Over 60% of Nobel Prize winners between 1900 and 2000 identified themselves as Christians. Over 60%. Hey, how about another clip? Well, maybe not a clip, just a quote. Recognize that guy, Morgan Freeman? He actually played God in a few movies. What were the titles? Yep. Evan Almighty, and what was the other one? You watch too many movies. You got the notes. He does have the notes. Evan Almighty and Bruce Almighty. He played God. Was God invented? That was the question asked Morgan Freeman. Here's his answer. Yes. Has anyone ever seen hard evidence? What we get is theories from our earlier prophets. Now, people who think that God invented us think that the earth can't be more than 6,000 years old. So I guess it is a question of belief. He even said at the end of our clip, I got faith. But the enemy has even taken that term, faith, and changed the definition on it. You tell me I'm going to heaven because I got faith, what's going to be my next question? What is faith? Faith in what? If faith is trust, then I'm going to ask you, then what are you trusting in? I'm going to pull that out of my toolbox. It's going to come out of my filing cabinet. If you tell me I've got faith, then I'm going to say, then tell me what faith is and what do you have it in? What is your foundation? Mr. Freeman is correct, by the way. It is a matter of belief and faith. Everyone has a faith system. Everyone on the planet has a belief system. 
And so I want to get into their filing cabinet and find out what they're believing in. And I'm going to challenge their thinking, and we're going to see that in a moment. I'm, I'm going to do, can I do one more? And okay, let's do one more. Uh, recognize him? Who is he? Ooh, you watch too many movies. He was in like my, one of my favorite movies, Gladiator. He played the bad guy, right? Man, he did a good, I hated him in the movie. If you can make me hate you, then you're doing a good job. He was in Walk the Line with Johnny Cash. Remember that? He played Johnny Cash. This is what he said. My brain is what's making sense of experience and feelings for me. So when that blankety blank cuts off, how can I understand or possibly feel anything? It's just my brain. It's the chemical functions that I interpret everything through, and that's what I trust in. I would like to ask him a question. The brain is the most complicated computer ever created in the universe, ever. We cannot even match the power of this thing that's operating in our heads. Joaquin, what I'd like for you to explain to me is, who put that operating system together? Where did it come from? This brain that you're depending on to interpret life. Where'd you get that information from? Who created that computer, Joaquin? And then one more. Y'all recognize her? Her name? Angelina. Everybody's whispering, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> she was asked, is there a God? Some people, I hope so for them. For the people that believe in it, I hope so. There doesn't need to be a God for me. All right, so, so why did I go through all of that? This is just a sampling of what's being offered in this generation from people that we might admire or respect or that we would listen to. So, so I went through this whole list to say, in fact, this is what we're up against. But, but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, what we're up against, we have the answers. I, I went into them just a little bit. I put my toe in the water. But we have the answers to the questions that they're asking. We do. Uh, Angelina, can I ask you one personal question? Sure, Wade, what would that be? We're on a first-name basis, by the way. Don't tell Kim that. <laughs> then what do you believe in and what do you base it on? I'm going to go into her filing cabinet. I'm going to challenge the, the files that she has set up her belief system on. And that's where I would go. That's a sampling of today. 1 Peter 3.15. Set Jesus Christ as the one who rules your hearts. Implication, that is something we need to be active in. How's that going? that Jesus is the one who has the authority in your hard drive, in your heart. It, it takes discipline for that to happen. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. That's the rooted series. And, and I love what Peter's telling us, and it is, we got the answers. We do. We have every answer to every one of their questions. We do. I hope you believe that. Um, I, just think back on all the faces of the people I showed, and I hope that you're thinking, how would you have answered what they said? I'm trying to challenge you and doing more than wet the hook. I'm trying to set the hook. One more video, and then we're going to wrap up with some discussion on how do you know there's a God. Can I pause this? It's not even started. Yeah, you can pause it. All right, hey, this guy is John Sorensen. He is now the president of Evangelism Explosion, EE. E. It, it's a PCA thing. Woo! It's one of the things that attracted me to our denomination, by the way. I came out of the Baptist church, and I thought, well, Presbyterians don't share their faith. And boy, was I wrong. I, I went into EE e. training, and now that's what I use in Africa to train pastors on how to share their faith. I've taken EE, e., put the cookies on the bottom shelf, and I teach that course now. We're all about evangelism in the PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America. 
Hey, in the evenings, I, I want to I cry out to you. In the evenings when you want to spend two hours wasting your brain cells watching a movie, I hope you hear a little voice in the background, and it's my Cajun voice whispering in your ear saying, don't do it. It's okay to veg every now and then. Look up EE e. and watch some of the clips like this clip that we're about to see, and I promise you it'll be food for your souls. I don't believe in God. The more we share our faith, the more likely we are at some point to encounter an objection or a tough question. And one of the more common objections is, I don't believe in God. When a person asks you how can you be sure that there is a God, begin by asking them what evidence you need to believe that God exists. You see, the average person will say something like, I have to see him. To that, you might reply, do you believe in air, gravity, love, or intelligence? Have you ever seen that? So is it really fair to use two different standards of proof, one for God and one for everything else that exists but can't be seen? To solve this problem, you can suggest ways that help you believe that God exists. The first one is the law of cause and effect. We use this line of reasoning every day. Whenever we see an effect, we naturally and correctly assume that there's a cause behind the effect. Think of it this way. We believe in the existence of air, gravity, love, and intelligence, not because we've seen them, but because we see the effect that they have. For example, we see dust blowing and leaves rustling, and we assume the presence of wind. In the same way, I believe in God, not because I see Him, but because I see all around me signs that logically point to a great invisible cause, whom I believe is God. This brings us to our second point, the evidence of design. When I look at my watch, I know that it didn't spontaneously self-assemble or evolve in slow stages from nothing. The watch's beautiful design points to a watchmaker. Likewise, looking at the wonders of the universe all around us, we see order, beauty, and design. We logically conclude that a beautifully designed watch points to a watchmaker, so it makes sense that an elegantly designed world points to the evidence of a world maker, a designer, who I call God. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa brings us to our third point the presence of personality. When looking at the Mona Lisa, we can see the evidence of personality and conclude logically that this painting could not have been the result of an impersonal cause. Because a cause must always be greater than its effect. Because the painting evidences personality, so the cause must have personality. In fact, it has to be a person. All around us is a beautifully orderly world filled with we reason then that the great cause or designer we spoke of earlier must have personality. In fact, it must be a person that I call God. This last point is an important one. Because a cause or a force cannot hold us accountable, but a person can and will. I'm John Swords, and this has been Reasonable Answers for Honest Skeptics. <laughs>Did y'all notice that Leonardo da Vinci looked a little bit like me when I was 30? We were almost identical, except for that little hat thing that Leonardo had. Hey, this is what, this is what he does in these video series. They're all very short, three to five minutes, and for me, I, gotta watch, I have to watch those two or three times. It's just a lot of information coming at you rapidly. But what he's trying to do is put the tools in our toolbox to answer the questions. And for this particular one is, how do you know that God exists? All right, the first folder that I pull out on this subject is cause and effect. That's my first go-to. If I'm talking to someone and they don't believe in a God, then I'm going to go to cause and effect, and I'll probably tell the story of the little boy and the stars. That's my go-to story that you cannot argue with it. How can these balls of fire that are millions of miles apart, how did they all just randomly start and exist? Without number, how did they fire up? Something had to light them. 
And so uh, I go to that. He used the leaves blowing, proves that there's air, cause and effect. Some people call this the prime mover argument. What pushes the first domino? All right, there was a big bang. Hey, that's great. Who lit the fuse? Well, it, it was spontaneous. Well, great, then where did the technology for the spontaneous eruption happen? And why isn't it happening again? I'm, if you want to go there, you want to pull your files out and listen to me. I'm going to get to this verse in a moment. I'm not going to argue with them or belittle them. I have to be very careful to be gracious, always, and I do not argue, and I've got a chapter and verse for that. The other one is the evidence of design. He used this one. Um, if you look at a watch or if you look at a clock, it's very complex. If a clock fell out of the sky, then we would all conclude that it happened over random time and chance, correct? That, that's what we would conclude. No, something had to have designed the clock. When you look at the earth, I'm, I'm going to do this one right here, and I don't even know if it's in my notes. I'm sitting, um, I had eye surgery, it went bad. It was all Mark Hill's fault. Um, Dr. Feist wasn't there, and so the guy, it was another guy that saw me in Gadsden that day, and we started talking about the eye, and he lit up like a Christmas tree. And he was telling me everything about the eye. This, this thing in your head is incredible what it does. It is incredible what it does. And he said, yeah, I find it's amazing that over millions of years that it happened. And I looked at him with a smile on my, on my face, and I said, so do you really believe that? That everything you just told me that happens in that mechanism happened with chance? Really? And he just smiled, and the conversation ended. But, but I pulled my file out, and I was ready to give an account for the hope that's within, that there really is a creator. There's no way that the I happened with time and chance. There's no way. Am I right, Mark? I, I, and I wish you would come up here and give a whole lecture on the eye, how incredible the eye is. The distance from the earth to the sun is perfect. If we were 100 miles closer or 100 miles further away, what would happen? We'd either burn up or we would freeze. Gravity. I am glad that gravity is perfect for the human body because we would all look like this might not be politically correct, Oompa Loompas. If there was too much gravity, we would all be smushed. If there was too little gravity, we'd be floating all over the place in the auditorium tonight, and it would be hard for me to keep your attention. And, and, and I could go th through the list of things with the evidence of design. Water. Just take that one. The beauty of H2O, or the atom. W when I'm dealing with someone that's highly intelligent, and they don't believe in God, I'm going to say, okay, then you have a chance to prove to me right now that there isn't a God. What I would like for you to do with all of your technology, could you just produce one atom for me? Protons, electrons, the nucleus, get the whole thing up and running. But could you do that from scratch? And could they do it? No, can't do it. What gets that thing running? What, what key, there's life in an atom. What gives it life to operate? What created that incredible design for atoms that are making up all of our bodies tonight? So, hey, cause and effect, the evidence of design, those are my first go-tos that I bring up. Um, and I, I'll use stories like the boy with the fire, I use the eye surgeon story now. I've used that one a number of times. Sometimes I'll pull out the second law of thermodynamics. That one's really good. If you're talking with intellectuals, and I'm fine, hey, I'm not an intellectual. I'm a C student, junior high guy. That's me. I did college. I enjoyed learning, but I wasn't a very good student. I was a C student. Everything I got, I had to work hard for. But I can talk about the second law of thermodynamics, which says what? You tell me. What's happening to matter and energy? Is it being created? It's changing forms and depletion. There is no new energy being created. 
in and of itself. It's all going downhill. Gee, why? Let's talk about the second law of thermodynamics. All right, I want to take some time. We're running out of time. That's okay. Next week, we're going to pick up where we left off. Is that okay? We're not going to fire a hose. We're just going to move this thing along. I'm not going to blah, 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 rattle off and cage in and kill some of you with that. Understanding the problem. If you would take your Bibles and let's go to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. If you don't have a Bible, there's one provided for you in the pew. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please take that one home. It's a gift from our new pastor, Ray Tucker. Because out of his salary, we're going to buy new ones. All right, understanding the problem. That's where we're at about acknowledging the existence of God. And Paul does an incredible job in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Most of you know this passage, but let's just walk through it looking with understanding at the words. Because every word is inspired and God has something to say to us about this tonight. I'm in Romans 1, and I'm picking up in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? They push the truth down. They shove truth down, and they do it in a way that does not please God. That's called unrighteousness. It's not right. Because that which is known about God is evident where? Go with it, where? No, not everywhere. What does it say? Within them. All right, listen to me very carefully. He's given us an edge. When it comes to sharing the truth of Jesus Christ, you and I have an edge, and the edge is this. On the inside, everyone knows that God really exists. Isn't that pretty cool? They're fighting against it, and they're pushing that truth down, and Paul is going to tell us why they're trying to push that truth away. But the truth is, inside everyone, they really know there's a right and a wrong and that they're going to be held accountable. Everyone knows that. Because that which is known of God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Hey, who put a conscience on board in the computer of every human? Who did it? God did it. So it's got to be pretty good. So use that as a tool in your toolbox. That's when, he, when they throw their momentum, then I'm going to take the momentum and use it in my answer. And I'm telling you it works. Verse 20. Not only within, but for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, one, his eternal power, two, his divine nature, three, are what? Clearly seen. You know three things about God just by looking at the creation. You know who he is, his attributes. We're going to talk about his attributes next week. You know how powerful he is. The little seven-year-old boy laying on the St. Augustine grass looking at the stars, saw the power of someone that could go millions of miles and light all the stars on fire. They got to be pretty big and pretty good. That was my conclusion. We see his attributes, his power, and we know his nature. We know him personally, who he is. It's clearly seen. Uh, the result is being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Brothers and sisters, on that day at the great white throne judgment, there's no one who's going to pull this off. No one will pull this off. Well, I didn't know. No one can pull it off. We're going we're to talk about in this series, what do you do with the native and the Amazon who's never heard about Jesus? This is one of the passages we're going to come back to. It's one of the files or the tools in the toolbox to understand the question, the answer to the question. Even though they knew God, assume it, assume it. In the world today, as you confront people, you assume they know God because of a conscience and because of the creation. They know it, but this is what they're doing, understanding the problem. Even though they knew God, number one, they did not honor him as God. That's called worship. The number one indictment that he had is you did not honor me and you knew I existed. And what is the number two? We didn't thank him. 
Who did we think? Nebuchadnezzar. Look at all the kingdom I built. I'm bad to the bone. He's the one that wrote that song back then. And God says, really, you're that bad? How about for seven years you're going to eat grass like a cow in the field? And when Nebuchadnezzar wakes up at year seven, hey, by the way, you're going to meet Neb in heaven. You can call him Neb. That's okay. It's his short name. I, I think he became a believer, and he concluded there was no one like the Most High God. I think Nebuchadnezzar became a believer in God. Anyway, back to this. Say again. Was that a cough? That's good. They didn't honor God. They didn't give thanks. They became futile watch in their speculations, in their filing cabinet. They, they had useless files, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They're walking in darkness. They're asking the questions. We have the light to answer the questions. We really do. They're searching for the truth, even if they are aggressive and militant about it. Why are you so angry with your truth? You have become worse than the people that you're fighting against with your bitterness. It's in my filing cabinet. They profess to be wise. I'm back to the filing cabinet. And they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image of the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Hey, by the way, let me, let me give you this one. Put this in your filing cabinet tonight. There is no evidence that there isn't a God. Put that in your filing cabinet. Prove to me that there isn't a God. Go. Pull your files out. Let's go to work. Well, because I can't see him. What's going to be my answer to that? Air, love. Gee, you don't believe in those either. I can't see that. See, you see how it builds that we have an answer from the hope that's within. And by the way, faith is the key. They believe what they believe on a system of faith just as much as you and I do. They have faith. The question is, what is their faith in? What are they trusting in? And the evil one has deceived them to believe lies that they trust in that will cost them for the rest of eternity. Faith is the key. What are you trusting in and what do you believe, base your belief on? Hey, I'm going to ask you that tonight. I'll go there. What are you trusting in? And what do you base your belief system on? That's what we're going to do. I'm going to push you during this series. What do you believe? And then Wade's going to do the next thing, then explain what you believe. What's the foundation for it? Why do you believe it? I'm going to do the next question. It's, it's the um, homiletics lab. Dr. Talley's the professor. I would raise my hand and give an answer. And he says, that's a very good answer, Mr. Hooper. Do you have a chapter and verse to go with it? He was pushing us to the book. Because the book is God's word. He pushed us there every time. I quit answering questions, by the way. Because <laughs> I didn't know my Bible very well back then. I still have much to learn. All right, I'm going to wrap it up at 7 o'clock. Um, next week, we're going to talk about how will the truth impact the way that we live. We're going to start there next week. How will the truth impact the way we live and I'm just going to lead you into next week very quickly. The truth should impact the way we live. We will gain the same mindset that our Father has, and we will go forth with the truth to tell other people. That's how, if we have the truth, then it should make a difference in our generation. I believe it. Amen? Amen. All right, so next week we're going to pick up there a lot of beautiful passages in Scripture to go and take a look at. Uh, we're gonna we'll pick up there next week. I'll say no more, and I'm quitting. I was gonna pick this up, and I'm not. It's seven o one. I went over. Our new pastor is fixing to fire me. All right. Hey, love you guys. Good to see you out tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit does equip us. He equips us for our generation. Let's all stand as we close in prayer. Father in heaven, that simple prayer at the beginning, 
that you would speak tonight. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to remember all that we need that we might serve you for the remainder of our days. I thank you you've given us everything for godliness and to deal with this life and the brokenness that we can make a difference in our homes, towns, cities around the world because we have the truth and the light. We praise your name. Most assuredly, you are merciful and good to us. Amen.